Okay, class. So in this section, we're going to talk about pulmonary circulation. So uh, we just finished talking about ventilation, and the other side to respiration is gas is uh, blood flow. We need blood flow in order to exchange gases. Um, so we're going to talk about that uh, right now. So um, just a bit of perspective: uh, your lungs are incredibly vascularized, um, incredibly vascularized. Um, you know, however, just, you know, in the grand scheme of things, only about 9% of it, um, of your total blood volume kind of hangs out in the lungs. Uh, that really indicates like how effectively, all right, that we, um, you know, we're exchanging gases, right? We're recycling through perfusion to the lungs, um, you know, in order to you know, exchange gases, to dump off CO2 and to uptake um, oxygen. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that, uh, you know, if we have a significant shift in, um, you know, in the systemic circulation, um, we can have, you know, you know um, have significant effects um, on the pulmonary system. The, the pulmonary blood, the pulmonary volume, um, which again, typically is about 450, uh, can be extracted or reduced down to 250, again, in situations where we have um, serious like you know, hemorrhage or something of that nature. So pulmonary blood volume does ap uh, operate as a reservoir uh, to, per to maintain systemic perfusion and circulation. Um, however, the pulmonary circulation can take a bit of a bit of a hit. That's why um, you know we can have serious complications um, with gas exchange potentially in people who have uh, hemorrhages, even though it's not like a lesion to the lungs per se. Maybe someone loses an arm or a leg or is bleeding. Um, but due to the nature of how we shift blood and move it around, we can have significant effects on our ability to exchange gases in our lungs. Uh, so uh, looking at pulmonary pressures, so um, unlike the systemic circulation, right? So there's an example just of what we see kind of in the aorta, uh, the pressures in the, um, you know, in the pulmonary side of things, right? Or the right circuit, of the heart um, are generally pretty low, right? So the systolic, the peak pressure that's going to be in the pulmonary artery only gets up to about 25 uh, millimeters of mercury. Diastolic, um, you know, about eight. So our resting pressure is in the mean being about 15. Um, you know, if you remember from our um, anatomy, right, the right ventricle is pretty thin. It does not uh, respond too well to increases in afterload. Um, so if, you know, we, because of that, we want to keep the pressures in the pulmonary artery fairly low. Again, remembering the right ventricle is very afterload sensitive and it does not have the ability to accommodate to large increases in afterload as, you know, as opposed to the left ventricle, which actually does. Um, so again, we keep the pressures in the pulmonary side pretty low. Right ventricle, again, it's not a super thick muscle. And if the pulmonary pressure is too high, we can cause the right ventricle to fail. Um, and as we move further and further down um, that pulmonary arterial or pulmonary circulatory tree, um, the pressures get lower and lower and lower um, as the vessels get smaller and smaller, obviously, the pulmonary capillary uh, pressure being around seven millimeters of mercury. Now, um, the pulmonary capillaries, like I mentioned, your lungs are incredible incredibly well vascularized. Uh, the alveolar walls, so here's our little alveoli here. They're little grapes. Remember we talked about how they had this grape-like morphology. They're bunches. That's, that's what allows for that incredible surface area. It's how it allows us to have 480 million alveoli per lung just because of this uh, geometric orientation. But they're so well vascularized that you could almost think the capillary blood flow to the lungs is like a sheet of blood rather than just individual capillaries. They are so incredibly well vascularized. And that's probably an evolved thing. Like we want these areas to have a good opportunity for gas exchange. Um, as well as the, the layer between the alveolus here and our capillary, right? It's about a self thin. It's incredibly thin, again, to really allow for that rapid and efficient exchange of gas. So again, our lungs are these fantastic organs um, to, you know, to do their job, which is to exchange gas, uptake CO2 and dump off O2, or CO2. So 
Uh, pulmonary blood flow through the lungs is essentially equal to cardiac output. So unlike we ha like we have in the periphery, we have all those uh, local control. We can have vasoconstriction, dilation by a lot of other factors. We don't really have that so much in the in the pulmonary vasculature. They're more or less passive, uh, distensible tubes that are really um, subject to changes in cardiac output from the right ventricle. So if cardiac output increases, uh, generally we're going to see an increase in pulmonary blood flow. Um, so in order for that to occur, we got to make sure that we're matching, um, you know, ventilation where we're breathing in air into the lungs with perfusion. Um, and we'll talk about some ways that we accomplish this to maintain, um, you know, distribution of blood flow, um, as well as to accommodate increases in blood flow that occur like during exercise, for example. Yeah, the name of the game, again, for, for perfusion and, res and respiration is getting, is distributing blood flow to areas of the alveoli, which are the most oxygenated, um, or really where the most ventilation is occurring. We will talk about this later, this concept of ventilation to uh, cardiac output or Q. You might remember that from our cardiac physiology, but ventilatory or ventilation to perfusion matching. We'll talk more about that concept of making sure we distribute blood to areas that have good oxygenation and good ventilation. Um, some key principles. So um, if you, you know, look at the lung um, in terms of its distance, um, it's about, there's about, you know, 30 centimeters between the highest or part of the lung or the apex to the bases of the lungs. Um, corresponds about 30 centimeters. Uh, this represents about a 23 millimeter murky pressure difference, okay? Um, 18 millimeters of that is below, or sorry, is above the heart, eight below. So um, when you're standing up, um, the pressure at the, in the upper part of the, of the lungs is about 15 millimeters mercury uh, less than is uh, below. Um, so what this means is that there's basically a hydrostatic column of, of fluid, if you think of it conceptually, in the lung, of course, which is the, which is the perfusion or blood flow. So at, at the basis, we have the highest amount of blood flow, the highest amount of volume of blood um, due to this hydrostatic pressure. And the further we move up the lung, right, there's less blood flow. And it's due to this hydrostatic um, pressure, okay? Because there's just, you know, we put, if you think of it conceptually, a fluid in a column, right, you know, we have it fixed, there's going to be a higher pressure on the bottom, as opposed to there would be on the top, okay. So in the standing position, there is, you know, you know, a, a little bit less blood flow, and in the bottom, there's about five times as much blood flow as it would be compared to the top. And so that has to do with, again, you know, this hydrostatic pressure um, influencing blood flow and blood volume. This is important be because of this, we see three types of um, or zones, if you think, of, of pulmonary perfusion um, throughout the lung, okay? So zone one perfusion, okay, is, uh, you know, is where we have, and it's, it's all about a balance between the alveoli air pressure here, and then the pulmonary capillary pressure, PPC. In zone one, perfusion, we have alveolar pressure that is always greater than, it's always greater than uh, the pulmonary capillary pressure, PPC, and therefore there is no blood flow during any portion of the cardiac cycle because the pressure in the capillary never exceeds or never is greater enough or greater than uh, capillary pressure, or sorry, alveolar pressure meaning that there is, you know, no perfusion, um, you know, moving through because this is constantly compressing it. Zone two perfusion would be intermittent blood flow. So there's, there's perfusion, but only during systole. So in this situation, pulmonary or this pressure, pulmonary capillary pressure um, during systole, when the downstream, that pressure wave that occurs during systole is able to overcome the alveolar air pressure and blood makes it through the capillary, gets to, you know, exchange gases and moves down to the, uh, the pulmonary veins, going back to the left ventricle. Um, so we see this typically in more of the regions of the, the upper segments, the zone two, this intermittent blood flow. Okay, so we when pressure is at its peak during systole, the, uh, 
pulmonary capillary pressure is able to overcome the alveolar pressure and there is perfusion, the blood flow gets through, gas exchange is able to occur. Um, we see this more in the upper segments of the lung due to that hydrostatic pressure we just talked about. In zone three perfusion, or there is continuous blood flow because the, um, the pulmonary capillary pressure is always greater than the alveolar pressure and we're able to have blood flow constantly um, through the pulmonary capillary entering back into the pulmonary veins into the left ventricle. Um, this allows for constant exchange of gas throughout the cardiac cycle. And as you guessed, we see this if we're in standing um, in the bases due to that hydrostatic pressure difference. Um, now, this is also why you might see in a hospital a patient um, you know, lie in um, prone because in, or in supine or you know, prone positioning um, because of how, high, how we shift perfusion. So when someone is in standing, that hydrostatic column, right, you know, we have that difference in pressure, you know, corresponding to the position in the lungs. When we lay people flat, one, there's a shunting of blood back to the mediastinum, and two, we kind of negate the hydrostatic column because everything's level. So now, you know, blood flow is equally distributed through the lungs. Um, every zone is now zone three, and we have much better perfusion to the lungs and much greater opportunity for gas exchange. So that's why you might see in someone with respiratory distress um, who's you know, they're, you know, you know, lacking the ability to exchange gases, they'll, they'll be positioned um, in prone to redistribute blood to allow for that continuous um, gas exchange. Now, in terms of hypoxia, so there may be some situations where the concentration of the oily air um, decreases below normal, um, or you know, one area is ventilated as well. Uh, we believe that there are sensors um, within the alveoli, within the small and the small arterioles uh, that secrete these vasoconstrictor uh, substances um, to reduce the amount of flow. Uh, this again is our goal for respiration is to match ventilation to cardiac output. If we've got really bad ventilation or if there's hypoxemia, we don't want to be sending blood flow um, to those areas because it's kind of wasting the fixed volume of blood we have. We want to put it to areas that are well oxygenated, that are well ventilated. Um, this is um, a protective effect it, um, by creating this shunt. So again, we, we you know in those areas where there's poor oxygenation or poor ventilation, the arterioles, the capillaries um, in those um, regions constrict Right, so we you know limit the amount of blood flow going to them, and it also allows us to redistribute blood to areas of the lung that are well oxygenated. Right, so we essentially create a zone one perfusion in that area and allow us to move blood flow to areas that are well oxygenated. Um, so we can m keep you know matching ventilation to perfusion. We think this is a protective effect. Um, in the lungs, if we notice that there is, you know, hypoxemia, or one area of the alveoli just aren't well ventilated. It's pretty cool how efficient our lungs are. And the last thing we'll talk about are blood flow changes that occur during exercise. Like I mentioned, the pulmonary capillaries are, you know, almost these distendable tubes. Like they're very dependent on cardiac output, unlike what we see in the systemic circulation. Um, we get a, um, you know, which can accommodate different things by constricting all that stuff. We don't really have that in, in, the, um, in the pulmonary capillary. So the problem is during exercise, cardiac output through the lungs increases four to maybe even sevenfold. Um, so if that moves too quickly, we won't have enough time potentially to, to exchange gases. Sorry about that. <laughs> to exchange gases, um, you know. We need, we need enough time. So to accommodate uh, that increase in perfusion, um, we will increase the number of capillaries sometimes as much as threefold, so more capillaries are recruited. Um, we will dilate the capillaries so we can take on more of that flow. And you might even see an increase in the pulmonary artery pressure, basically the pump the brakes a little bit on the right ventricle. Again, this 
Um, it has you know, two, two primary effects. One, it slows down in a certain sense the rate of perfusion through the lungs to give the capillaries and the alveoli enough time to exchange gases. The other is remembering back to filtration pressures. If we're flooding the lungs and the circulation with a lot of extra perfusion, if we are not able to distribute that pressure and flow, we could end up building up fluid and exudate into the lungs, calling pul pulmonary edema um, because we've you know, raised the pressures too much in the capillaries. This allows us to accommodate that um, and prevent, again, pulmonary edema by um, you know, uh, filtration pressures in the capillaries that are too high. And this is an example of just what we see here, right? So yeah, this is what we see occurring at rest. So we can recruit more capillaries are, um, you know, opened up and the ones that are, you know, open distend to accommodate that greater blood flow that occurs during exercise. Um, the great thing about our lungs during exercise, and we talked about the zone two and zone three patterns. Like we mentioned, um, zone three, we have constant gas exchange. Uh, zone two, we have that intermittent gas exchange. However, due to those increases in perfusion um, and pressure, um, you know, through the pulmonary capillary, as we begin to exercise, right, we see, you know, greater flow, right? So we can see this is our plot during exercise, again, from the bottom to the top. Um, you know, our apices, right, our top parts of our lungs um, during exercise are almost very similar to what our bases would be at rest. This means that during exercise, our entire lung um, uh, converts to a zone three pattern. What does this mean? This means that during exercise, our lungs are even better at exchanging gases than they are at rest. Um, and again, this is probably an evolved trait to make our lungs even more efficient when we need to use them, like when we're running from that saber-toothed tiger. So again, the soup and nuts of this is that um, during exercise, you know, there's a lot more blood flow through the lungs, four to seven times the cardiac output. We have systems in place to accommodate that um, increase in speed and increase in pressure to allow us to have enough time to exchange gases, to prevent the development of pulmonary edema from you know, you know, preventing the pressures from getting too high. Um, and what this, often, what this also allows for is a conversion in throughout the entire lung to zone three perfusion so that we have constant perfusion through the lungs um, through every segment. So every segment has this optimal blood flow pattern. Um, and again, this is really kind of due to the fact that, you know, you know, this, you know, we want to be moving. We want to make sure that our lungs um, are able to keep up with us. Um, I probably should have had this slide a little bit earlier, but this talks again about um, the, the reason why we slow things down, right? So normally it takes about 0.8 seconds for our lungs or for our capillaries to, you know, do their thing in the lungs, dump off CO2, take on O2. Um, but if that happens during exercise, that can shorten to as little as 0.3 seconds. So these um, adaptations slow that down to allow us to um, have enough time to exchange gases. And again, we talked about all the other protective effects um, and even things that optimize perfusion. So again, like we mentioned in the very beginning, your lungs have an incredible capacity for ventilation. They have an incredible reserve for ventilation. The, our mechanical efficiency, the pressures we need to draw in air into our lungs is incredibly low. Like we have, you know, we can generate 100 centimeters of water of pressure with our respiratory muscles, and we only need about five, essentially, you know, to 10 to breathe, um, at most 40 at a maximal breath. And, you know, we, our lungs get even better at doing their job when we're exercising. Um, so with that, um, we're gonna move on to, uh, respiration and gas exchange in our next unit. Thank you.